I am very happy to introduce this year's update on the State of the Onion. This is a talk with about five speakers, so let's introduce them one by one. First, Roger. He had, did it the last talk. He's the founder of the Tor project, <laughs> MIT graduate, <laughs> and top 100 global thinkers. I'm not doing it. <laughs> Then we have Jake, a humble PhD math student. <laughs> That is, in my opinion, not a national security threat, but a post-national security promise. We have Mike Perry, and I think it is enough to say about him that the NSA calls him a worthy adversary. He is also the lead dev of the Tor browser. And then we have Alison Macrina, a radical militant librarian. <laughs> And last but not least, Shari Steele, the new executive director of the Tor project. <laughs> so without further ado, this year's State of the Onion. All right. Well, it's it's a great honor to be back here again, and uh, we're really happy to be able to introduce so many more faces. It's no longer the Roger and Jake show, and uh, that's very important to us. Hopefully, next year we won't be here, but we'll still be alive. So, 2015, if I were to express it in a in a in a hand gesture or with a facial expression, it would look something like oh. <laughs> It was a really, it was a, it was a year of big changes. Not all of them were really good changes, and there were a lot of heavy things that happened throughout the year. And we won't even be able to cover all of them because we only have an hour. Um, so we want to focus on the positive things. And I would say that probably the nicest thing is that we're growing. We're really, really growing. Not only growing the network, but we're growing the community. And in some sense, we're expanding throughout the whole world in terms of users who are using Tor, what Tor users are using Tor for, which is, of course, extremely important, that there is more and more people just doing regular things with Tor, protecting themselves. But Then we have, of course, lots of specialized things that happen with the Tor network as well. We have things like onion balance and ricochet, really exciting developments, and we'll talk a bit about all of those things. And one of the most unlikely things, at least when I imagine working on Tor, say, 10 years ago versus now, is that we've worked with some really unlikely partners. Um, some of you know that I'm not really a big fan of uh, Silicon Valley's uh, Silicon Valley, even though I'm from there. Um, and so I'm, you know, I sometimes call Facebook not so nice names, like Stasi Book. And part of the reason for that is because I think it's a little bit weird that you report on all your friends in order to go to parties. And um, previously it was to get into the party, and now it's to go to parties. And yet we worked with them on something. Because it turns out that sometimes you have unlikely temporary alliances. And it turns out that, well, I personally may think that they are evil incarnate in some sense. It is the case that there is at least one good guy there. And Alec worked on this fantastic RFC, 7686, that actually allowed us to help all Facebook users mitigate some harm which is that if they want to be able to visit Facebook, and I guess that the reality is that you know, not using Facebook for a lot of people is sort of like the kill your television bumper sticker of the 90s, for those of you that ever visited rural America. You know that that wasn't like a really successful campaign. Uh, a lot of people have TVs these days as well. So it's a little bit like that, only here we actually built an alternative where we can mitigate harm. And that's really incredibly important because it mitigates harm in all sorts of different pieces of software. It makes it possible for us to talk to browser vendors, to DNS resolvers. And part of this was motivated by some investigative journalism that, that I actually did, where I revealed X key score rules where the US government's national security agency was sifting through all of the internet traffic to look for .onion addresses. So when they saw DNS requests for .onion, they were actually learning .onions by harvesting traffic. And that really motivated me to want to make it so that DNS resolvers didn't do that anymore. It was very important because, I, I mean, one of my core missions with Tor is to make that kind of stuff a lot harder for the spies to do and protecting everyday users, even users who aren't Tor users yet. 
And that's very important. And so working with Alec on this has been great because the IETF actually supports this. And now I can will not sell .onion to anyone. It's a special use reserve name. And that's incredible. Okay, so um, is this thing on? Yes, it is, great. Uh, so there are a couple of interesting graphs that we're gonna give you of usage uh, scenarios, usage instances uh, over the past year. So pretty recently, uh, we were looking at the number of people in Russia using Tor. Russia's been talking about censoring, talking about all sorts of oppression steps. And uh, at the beginning of November, we moved from, I don't know, 180,000 people in Russia each day using Tor up to almost 400,000 people. And this is probably a low estimate. So many hundreds of thousands of people for that two week period, which started with a Russian bomber getting shot down, were trying to get news from the rest of the world rather than news as Russia wanted to show it to them. So that's kind of a cool event. Another interesting event, uh, Bangladesh ended up censoring Facebook and some other websites, and a whole lot of people switched to using Tor. I was actually talking to one of the Facebook people, and they have their own internal statistics about uh, number of people connecting over to the Tor network to Facebook, and it would be super cool to superimpose these two graphs. Our data is public and open, and we like sharing it. Uh, they don't actually share their data, but one day it would be really cool to be able to see both of these graphs at once to see users shifting from reaching Facebook directly to going over Tor. Um, the other interesting thing from the Bangladesh side, I was looking at the Alexa top websites around the world, and we're torproject.org is like 8,000th uh, in the, the global rankings, but at least for the past couple of weeks, uh, torproject.org has been 300th in Bangladesh. So there are a whole heck of a lot of people there learning about these privacy things that can get around local censorship. Okay, and then uh, uh, an exciting other story that we're going to touch on briefly, but it's an entire talk on its own. Um, so let me give you a couple of facts and we'll go from there. Uh, last, so January of 2014, 100 relays showed up in the Tor network and we weren't sure who was running them, but they weren't exit relays, so they didn't seem like they were such a threat at the time. And fast forward a while later, uh, CMU, the CERT organization inside CMU, uh, submitted a, a, a presentation to Black Hat on how cool they were for being able to attack Tor users, and they talked about how they were going to talk about individual users that they de-anonymized, and how cool they were for that. And I spent a while trying to extract details from them, and eventually I learned what their attack was, and then Nick Mathewson, one of the other Tor developers, uh, decided to check the, the Tor network to see if anybody was actually doing that attack. I mean, it's CERT, they're the folks who publicized the phrase responsible disclosure. Surely they're not actually uh, undermining the Tor network and attacking Tor users. Uh, but then it turns out somebody was doing the attack and it was these 100 relays that looked kind of ordinary and innocuous before that. And then I sent mail to the CERT people saying, hey, are those relays yours? and they went silent. They've never answered any of my mails since then. So that's what we know. It doesn't look good. Um, one of the, the key things that we Tor have done from here is we've been working on strengthening the Tor network and getting better at recognizing these things. So the, the core of the attack was that they did what's called a Sybil attack where you sign up a lot of relays and you become too large a fraction of the Tor network. So we've been working on a lot of ways to recognize uh, that an attack like that is happening and mitigate it and get rid of it early. So for example, uh, Philip Winter has a, a bunch of interesting research areas on recognizing similarity between relays. So you can automatically start detecting, wait a minute, this event happened where a lot of relays are more similar than they should be. Uh, another example there is uh, we used to say, well, I don't know who's running them, but they don't seem that dangerous, so okay, it's good to grow the Tor network. Now we're taking the other approach of, gosh, that's weird, let's get rid of them, and then we'll ask questions after that. So we're trying to be more aggressive, more conservative at keeping the Tor network safe from large adversaries, whether they're uh, government organizations or corporations or individuals, whoever might be attacking it.
So we have had a few really big changes in the Tor community. Um, one of them is that we had an interim executive director uh, come on in a sort of uh, quick moment, and that's Roger Dingledine. <laughs> Some of you probably always thought he was the executive director the whole time, and that's because for a while he was, and then he wasn't, and then he was back again. And that change was quite a huge uh, change in that instead of working on a lot of anonymity stuff, uh, Roger was doing a lot of bureaucratic paperwork, which was actually quite sad for the anonymity world, I think. He probably reviewed fewer papers and did fewer anonymity things this year than ever before, um, which is really, really sad. But that really lit a fire under us to make sure that we would actually change that, to make sure that it was possible to get someone else who was really good at being an executive director of the Tor project to really lead so that we could have Roger return to not only being an anonymity researcher, but also the true spirit animal of the Tor project. He doesn't look like an onion, but in spirit. <laughs> Another Slide. really <laughs> So another really big thing that happened is working with Laura Poitras over the last many years, um, we I mean she's followed uh, the Tor project. Um, you know, lots of people like to follow people in the Tor project, but she we consented to her following us. And she made a film, Citizen Four. I think some of you have any of you seen this film? <laughs> Right, so um, quite amazingly, she won an Oscar. Actually, she basically won every film prize. <laughs> and one of the key things is that people in this room that work on free software were explicitly thanked. If you work on Tails, if you work on GNU PG, if you work on SecureTrop, uh, OTR, Tor, she specifically said in the credits of the film, this film wouldn't have been possible without that free software actually making her job and the jobs of her source and other people involved making it possible. And so her winning that Oscar in some sense, uh, it feels like closing a really big loop that had been open for a very long time and it's really great. And so she, uh, I think, really wishes she could be here today uh, again. She sends her regards and uh, she's really, really thankful for everybody here that writes free software for freedom. Ready? So another exciting event that happened in 2015 is that Reddit gave us $83,000. They had some extra profit and they decided that they would give it to 10 nonprofits chosen from among the Redditor community. And there were people who came to me and said, hey, Roger, you really have to you know, start advocating and start teaching everybody why Tor should be one of them. And I said, oh, I'm busy. Those things never work. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll choose somebody else. And so it turns out that we were the 10th out of 10 without doing any advocacy work whatsoever to the Reddit community, which is super cool that they care about us so much. Also, Reddit divided the 10 equally. So even though we were the 10th out of 10, we got 10% of the, the donations that they were giving out. Um, one of the really, uh, I would say one of the oddest things about working at the Tor project for me is that Tor really, um, Tor has supported me through really crazy times. So when I was being detained by the US government or having my property stolen by fascist pigs in the US, uh, United States government's border checkpoints, Tor didn't fire me. Tor always backed me, always kept me safe. Uh, many people often look like they wanted to kill me from stress, but often they didn't, which was nice, or they didn't get close enough and I could move fast enough. But they were always very helpful. And They've really helped me to go and do things to speak for anonymous users who can't go other places. And one of the places which I was most honored to go in the last year uh, was actually scheduled to go there with Casper Bowden, but unfortunately he was ill at the time, and as you know, Casper uh, has since uh, passed away. But we were scheduled to go together and Tor was supporting us both actually to go to this. And um, it, it resulted, I believe, in a very amazing meeting in Geneva at the United Nations where the special rapporteur actually endorsed Tor and off the record messaging and encryption programs and privacy and free software saying that they are absolutely essential and in fact their use should be encouraged from a human rights perspective. And in fact, the really amazing part about it is he didn't do it only from the perspective of free speech. And this is important because actually there are other rights and we should think about them. So for example, the right to form and to hold an idea is a right that cannot be abridged. 
The right to free speech can be abridged in many free societies, but what is in your head and how you form it is something where that is not a right that can be abridged. And he wrote this in the report. And he, when writing this report with many other people, made it very clear that this is something we need to keep in mind, that when we talk about private spaces online where groups may collaborate to form ideas, to be able to create a political platform, for example, to be able to make democratic change, they need to be able to use the internet to freely exchange those ideas in a secure and anonymized encrypted fashion. And that helps them to form and to hold ideas. And obviously that helps them later to express free speech ideas. And that's a huge thing to have the United Nations endorse basically what many of us in this room have been saying for, well, decades. So the UN thing is really cool. We've also been doing some other policy angles. So Stephen Murdoch, who's a professor in England and also part of the Tor community, has worked really hard at teaching the British folks that their new uh, backdoor laws and their new terrible laws are actually not what any reasonable country wants. So he's put a huge amount of energy into uh, basically advocating for freedom for them. And similarly, Paul Syverson, part of the Tor community, uh, basically ended up writing a post note for the UK about how the dark web is, not, is, is misunderstood, see previous talk. Uh, so we've been doing quite a bit of education at the policy level to try to teach the world that encryption is good and safe and worthwhile and should be the default around the world. Yeah, and there's a kind of interesting thing here. I'm maybe a little contentious with some people in the Tor community, but I just wanted to make it really clear. We have the Tor Project, which is a, a nonprofit in the United States, and we have a much wider Tor community all around the world. And in Berlin, we have a really, really like an incredible Tor community. We have people like Donica working on Onion Balance. We have people like Lee Riggi working on Banana Phone. We have all these different people working on all sorts of free software. And many of those people don't actually work for the Tor project. They're community members, they're volunteers, they're some of privacy students. And so uh, the Renewable Freedom Foundation actually funded the creation of a sort of separate space in Berlin where people work on these kinds of things, which is not affiliated with US government money. It's not affiliated with the Tor project as uh, some sort of corporate thing. It's not a multinational thing. It's really the peer-to-peer -peer version, in some sense, of what we've already had in other places. And it's really great. And I wanted to just thank Moritz, who made that happen, and to all the people like Aaron Gibson and Juris, who actually put that space together and made it possible. So in Berlin, there is a space, not just C-based, not just CCCB, but actually a place which is about anonymity. It's called Zwiebelraum. And this is a, a place in which people are working on this free software and they're doing it in an independent manner. And we hope actually that people will come together and to support that because we need more spaces like that that are not directly affiliated with the Tor project necessarily, but where we have an aligned mission about reproducible builds and free software and also about anonymity and actually about caring about free speech and actually making it happen and really building spaces like that all around the world. So if you have a place in your town where you want to work on those things, we would really hope that you will work on building that. I called it general cypherpunkery. I feel like that's a good description. There's lots of stuff to be done. Um, and now um, for a Marxist joke. So we discovered the division of labor, which was a really important discovery. We're about 180 years too late, but we, we started to split up. That didn't go very well. The Marxist, I, why? But <laughs> tears, tears. So the Vegas teams are really simple. Basically, we have a bunch of people that previously they did everything. And this really doesn't work. It's very stressful and it's very frustrating and it leads to people doing lots and lots of things in a very unfocused way. And so we split it up. And it actually happened naturally. It was emergent. So for example, um, Mike Perry, who's gonna talk about the applications team's work in, in a second here, um, you know, he was already leading this. He was really making this happen. And so we just made it more explicit. And in fact, we created a, a way of communicating and reporting back so that you don't have to like drink from the fire hose about absolutely everything that's happening everywhere, but you can sort of tune into those things, which means we get higher level understandings. And that is a really incredibly useful thing that has made us much more productive. And that was part of the growing pains of the last year, actually, was figuring out how to make that work because we're a pretty flat group in terms of a community and a pretty flat group in terms of an organization writing free software and advocating. 
And so that's a really incredibly good thing, which will come up all the time. You'll hear people talking about the metrics team, or the network team, or the application team, or the community team, and that's what we're talking about in that sense. So we tried to formalize it, and in some ways we may be moving in a sort of Debian model a little bit, and we'll see how that actually goes. Um, so we have a really great uh, person here to explain the work of the metrics team. Okay, so uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what the metrics team has been working on lately to give you a sense of, uh, of some of the, the components of the Tor community. So there are five or ten people who work on the metrics team. We actually only pay one-ish of them, so most of them are volunteers. And that's, on the one hand, that's great. It's wonderful that there are researchers all around the world who are contributing and helping to visualize and helping to do analysis on the data. On the other hand, it's sort of sad that we don't have a, a full team of full-time people people uh, who are working on, th on this all the time. So it would be great to, to have your assistance uh, working on this. Uh, so actually metrics has been accumulating all sorts of analysis tools over the past five years. So there are up to 30 different little tools. There's Atlas and Globe and STEM and 20 something more, uh, which is a challenge to keep coordinated, a challenge to keep maintained. Uh, so they've been working on how to, how to integrate these things and, uh, and, and make them more usable and maintainable and extensible. Uh, so one example that they, uh, so they, they wrote some slides for me to present here. One example that they were, uh, looking at to give you an example of how this analysis works is bad relays in the Tor network. So maybe that's an exit relay that runs, but it modifies traffic or it watches traffic or something. Uh, maybe, it's <coughs> maybe it's a relay that signs up as a, as a hidden service directory, and then when you publish your onion address to it, it goes to visit it or it puts it on a big list or something like that. Uh, or maybe bad relays are Sybils, who uh, we were talking earlier about the uh, 2014 attack where 100 relays showed up at once. Um, and we, the directory authorities, have a couple of ways of, of addressing bad relays. One of them is uh, each of the directory authorities can say, that relay needs to, to get out of the network. We just cut it out of the network. We can also say uh, bad exit. We can also say that relay is no longer going to be used as an exit. So even though it advertises that it can reach uh, blockchain and other websites, clients choose not to do it that way. So that's the, the background. Um, one of the tools that uh, Damien wrote a while ago is called Tor Consensus Health, and it looks every hour at the new list of relays in the network, and it tries to figure out, is there something suspicious that just happened at this point? And in this case, it looks for a bunch of new relays showing up all at the same time with similar characteristics, and it sends email to a list. Uh, so that's useful. The, the, second the second piece of the analysis is, okay, what do you do when that happens? So we get an email saying, hey, 40 new relays showed up. What's up with that? Uh, so there's a, there's a real challenge there to decide, do we allow the Tor network to grow? Sounds good. Or do we wonder who these people are and, and try to contact them or cut them out of the network or constrain what fraction of the network they can become? <laughs> So Philip Winter also has a, a visualization in this case of uh, basically which relays were around on a given month. So the, the x-axis is uh, all the different relays in the month, and the y-axis is each hour during that month. And they've sorted the relays here by uh, how much they were present in the given month. And you'll notice the red blocks over there are relays that showed up at the same time, and they've been consistently present at the same time since then. So that's kind of suspicious. That's, hey, wait a minute, what's that pattern going on there? So this is a cool way of visualizing and being able to drill down and say, wait a minute, that pattern pattern right there, something weird just happened. So part of the challenge in general for the metrics team is they have a terabyte of interesting data of what the network has looked like over the years. How do you turn that into, wait a minute, that right there is something mysterious that just happened, let's look at it more. So you can look at it from the visualization side, but you can also, there's a tool called Onionu where you can basically query it, all sorts of queries, and it, it dumps the data back onto you. So we've got a terabyte of interesting data out there, what the relays are on the network, what sort of statistics they've been 
uh, reporting, when they're up, when they're down, uh, whether they change keys a lot, whether they change IP addresses a lot. <coughs> so we encourage you to uh, investigate and look at these tools and, and so on. So there's a, a new website we set up this year called Collector, collector.torproject.org, that has all of these different data sets and pointers to all these different libraries and tools and so on that you too can use to investigate, graph, visualize, and so on. So here's another example. Uh, at this point, we're looking at the nine directory authorities in the network. Each of them votes its opinion about each relay. So whether the relay is fast or stable or looks like a good exit uh, or, uh, or maybe we should vote about bad exit for it. So the gray lines are all of the directory authorities thought that it didn't deserve the flag, and it's very clear. The green lines are enough of the directory authorities said that the relay should get the flag, also very clear. And all the brown and light green and so on in the middle are contradictions. That's where some of the directory authorities said, yes, it's fast, and some of them said, no, it's not fast. And this gives us a visualization, a way to see uh, whether most of the directory authorities are agreeing with each other. Uh, we should look at this over time. And if suddenly there's a huge brown area, then we can say, wait a minute, uh, something's going on where maybe a, a set of relays are trying to look good to these directory authorities and trying not to look good to these. So basically, it, it helps us to, to recognize patterns of weird things going on. Uh, so on Collector, you can find uh, all sorts of data sets, and you can uh, fetch them and do your analysis of them. And Tor Metrics, metrics.torproject.org, has a bunch of examples of this analysis where you can look at graphs of uh, number of people connecting from different countries, number of relays over time, number of new relays, number of bridges, users connecting to bridges, and so on. Uh, there are three different libraries that help you to parse these various data sets. So there's one in Python, one in Java, one in Go. So whichever one of those you enjoy most, you can grab and, uh, and start doing analysis. Uh, they do weekly or so IRC meetings. So the Tor Metrics team invites you to show up on January 7, and they would love to have your help. They have a bunch of really interesting data. They have a bunch of really interesting analysis tools, and they're missing curious people. So show up. Start asking questions about the data. Try to learn what's going on. And you can learn more about them on the metrics team there. And then I'm going to pass it on to Mike. OK. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, so I'll be talking about the applications team part of the Vegas plan that, that Jake uh, introduced. Basically, the applications team is was created to bring together all the aspects of Tor and the extended community that are working on anything that's user facing. So anything with a user interface that, uh, that the user will directly interact with that's an application on either mobile or, or desktop. So to, to start, obviously we had the Tor browser. That's sort of like our flagship application that most people are familiar with when they think of Tor. Um, we, recently, we've added Orfox, which is a project by the Guardian project to port the Tor browser patches to Android. And that's currently in alpha status, but it's available in the Guardian project's uh, F-Droid repo. We also have two chat clients, Tor Messenger and Ricochet, um, both with different security properties uh, that we'll be getting to later. So I guess first off, let's talk about what happened in the Tor browser world uh, in 2015. Um, basically, most of the, our, or a good deal of our work is spent keeping up with the Firefox release treadmill. Um, that includes uh, responding to uh, emergency releases, auditing uh, changes in the Firefox code base, making sure that their, their features adhere to our privacy model, and making sure that our releases come out the same day as the official Firefox releases so that there's no uh, vulnerability exposure to known vulnerabilities after they're disclosed. Uh, that uh, has been a bit rough over 2015. I believe there was a solid three to four months where it felt like we were doing a release every two weeks due to either log jam or um, a random NSS vulnerability or um, uh, any arbitrary, you know, security issue with Firefox. 
Um, but we did, despite treading all that water, we did manage to get quite a bit of work done. Uh, as always, our work on the browser focuses in three main areas, typically privacy, security, and usability. Um, our privacy work is primarily focused around making sure that any new browser feature uh, doesn't enable new vectors for third-party tracking. So no ways for a third-party content resource to store uh, state or cookies or, or uh, blob URLs or some of the newer features. Um, there's a new cache API. Uh, these sorts of things need to all be isolated to the URL bar domain to prevent third parties from being able to track you from being able to recognize it's the same you when you log into Facebook and when you visit CNN and CNN loads uh, the Facebook like buttons, for example. Um, additionally, we have done a lot of work on fingerprinting defenses. The alpha release ships a set of fonts for the Linux users so that uh, the font fingerprinting can be normalized since a lot of Linux users will ha tend to have different fonts installed on their systems, um, as well as tries to normalize the font lists that are allowed for Windows and Mac users where they often get additional fonts from third-party applications that install them. Um, on the security front, the major exciting piece is the security slider. So with ISEC partners' uh, help, we did a review of all of the Firefox vulnerabilities um, and categorized them based on the component that they were in, as well as their prevalence on the web, and came up with four positions that allow you to choose, basically trade off uh, functionality for vulnerability surface reduction. And this was actually quite successful. It turned out that all of the pwn to own uh, exploits against Firefox were actually blocked for non HTTPS sites um, at medium high. And if you enabled the high security level, they were blocked for, for everything. Um, we additionally released address sanitizer hardened builds. These are uh, basically should, especially at the higher security levels of the security slider, should protect against various memory safety issues in, in the browser and also help us diagnose issues uh, very, very rapidly. And of course, we now sign our Windows packages uh, using an off, uh, a hardware security module from Digicert. Um, the usability improvements were primarily focused around this U UI and this new Onion menu. As you can see, if you remember the old menu, there was a, quite, a, quite a lot more options there. We sort of condensed and consolidated options and eliminated uh, and combined as much as we could. And additionally displayed the uh, circuit for the current URL bar domain. In 2016, we'll be focusing mostly on, again, the same three areas. Our main goal for privacy is to try and convince Mozilla that they want to uh, adopt our idea of isolating third-party identifiers, at least to the point of if the user goes into the preferences and tries to disable third-party cookies, well, that should do the same thing for DOM storage, cache, uh, blob URLs, worker threads, and all these other sources of, of shared state. Um, we're very excited about their work on the multi-process sandbox. Additionally, um, even application level sandboxing, it should be with, without Mozilla's uh, uh, sandbox, we should still be able to prevent the browser from bypassing Tor using SecComp or AppArmor or Seatbelt or one of these other sandboxing technologies. So we're looking forward to trying to get that rolled out. We'll be doing exploit bounties. Um, We'll be partnering with uh, HackerOne, we'll be announcing this shortly. Uh, the program will start out invite only, and then just to, so we can get used to the flow and scale up, and then we will make it public uh, later in the year to basically provide people with uh, incentive to review our code, uh, to look for vulnerabilities that might be specific to, to our applications. And of course, the usual usability, improving security, improving installation, um, and uh, we'd like to improve the, the censorship and bridge usability flow as well, hoping to automate the discovery of bridges and, and inform you if your bridges become unreachable. Um, so Tor Messenger is one of our two chat clients, uh, also part of the applications team. Basically, the goal there was to minimize the amount of configuration that the user had to do if they wanted to use one of their existing chat clients with uh, Tor and OTR. Now this is based on another Mozilla platform, um, Instant Bird, which is based on Thunderbird. This allows us to share uh, the 
a lot of the Tor browser configuration codes for managing the, the Tor process and configuring bridges. So the user has a very similar configuration experience to, uh, to the browser uh, when, they, when they first started up. Uh, it also has some additional memory safety advantages. The, all the protocol parsers are written in JavaScript. Um, this basically, one of the major things when we were looking at candidates for, for this, uh, for, the, for a messaging uh, client, was we wanted to avoid the problems of live purple in the past, where there's been a lot of like, remote code execution vulnerabilities with protocol parsing. Um, now, there are some trade-offs here. Obviously, when you're dealing with a, a browser product, um, you still have an HTML window rendering the, the messages, um, but there, it is XSS filtered, and the, even if an XSS exploit were, were to get through to, to run JavaScript in your messaging window, uh, that JavaScript would still be unprivileged, um, so they'd need an additional browser-style exploit. Um, and that filter has been reviewed by Mozilla. And additionally, we're looking into removing JavaScript from that messaging window at all. It should be completely possible to just display uh, a reduced, um, slightly less sexy version of the, the same window at perhaps another higher security level without JavaScript uh, involved at all in that window. So I believe I'll hand off to Jake now to describe some of the security properties and differences between Tor Messenger and Ricochet. Well, so, I mean, just to be uh, clear about this, we, we wanted to um, sort of echo what Phil Rogaway has recently said. He wrote a really wonderful paper uh, quite recently about the moral character of cryptographic work. And Phil Rogaway, for those of you that don't know, is one of the sort of like amazing cryptographers, very humble, oh, really wonderful man, who was really a little bit sad that cryptographers and people working on security software don't take the adversary seriously. So they use Alice and Bob and Mallory, and they have cutesy icons, and they look very happy. We wanted to make it clear what we thought the adversary was, which is definitely not a cutesy adversary. Um, when anonymity fails for Muslims that live in Pakistan, or for example, the guys that are giving a talk later today, the cage guys, when anonymity fails for them, they get detained or they get murdered or they end up in Guantanamo Bay or other things like that. So it's a serious thing. And we wanted to talk about what that looks like. So for example, a lot of you use jabber.ccc.de, I guess. Don't raise your hands. Uh, you should decentralize. Stop using jabber.ccc.de because we should decentralize. But that said, if you do, this is sort of what it looks like, right? There's the possibility for targeted attacks when you connect. There's the possibility that the social graph, for example, of your buddy list, that that would be on the server. It would be possible that there's a bug on any Jabber server anywhere. So of course, you know that if you're using Gmail with Jabber, you know that they're a prism provider. So you've got a pretty big problem there. And the attacker, again, is not a cutesy attacker. It's, you know, I like the Grim Reaper that, that, that Mike chose. I feel like that's accurate. Um, and now, if you see one of the protections you'll have for communicating with your peers is off-the-record messaging. That's basically the thing. But that's a very slapped-together protocol, in a sense, uh, because it's hacks on top of hacks, where you, know, you, you compose Tor with Jabber and TLS, and maybe you still have a certificate authority in there somewhere. Or maybe you have a Tor hidden service, but then your status updates, they don't have any encryption at all, for example. Or again, your roster is uh, an actual thing that you know, someone can see, including every time you send a message to those people, the server sees that. So that said, Tor, Tor Messenger is really great because it meets users where they already are. Right? So for example, actually, one other point here is if you use a piece of software like Adium, there's actually a bug filed against Adium where someone said, please disable logging by default because Chelsea Manning went to prison because of your logging policy. And the people working on Adium in this bug report basically said, good. That's horrifying, right? So what if we made it as reasonable as possible, as configuration-free as possible, using Tor, using OTR, trying to remove libpurple, which is a whole, like it's a flock of zero days flying in formation, right? So we wanted to, <laughs> we wanted to kill the bird, in a sense. But, but also not, not we, you know, we want to help uh, provide an incentive for improving. And so that's where Tor Messenger fits. But we also want to experiment with next generation stuff. And one of those things is uh, written by a really great guy in our community, um, almost single-handedly, without any funding at all. Uh, and his name is Special. That's actually his name. Um, he's also special. Um, 
But it's, a, it's really nice because actually, if you solve the problem of telling your friend your name, if you're familiar with the properties of hidden services where you have a self-authenticating name, you know that you're talking to the person that you think you are because you've already done a key exchange, the important part of the key exchange. And so one of the things that you'll, one of the things that you'll see very clearly is that there is no more server. Right? So there's no more jabber.ccc.de in this picture. So this is a really good example of how we might decentralize, actually. It's an experiment right now, but it means no more servers. It uses the Tor Network's Tor Hidden Service protocol, and everybody actually becomes a Tor Hidden Service for chatting with their buddies. And it's end-to-end -end encrypted, and it's anonymized. And of course, this means that your, your social graph is a traffic analysis problem. It's no longer a list on a server. And it means your metadata is as protected as we currently know how to do in a low latency anonymity network. And in the future, one of the really nice things about this is that it'll be possible, um, well, we think it'll be possible to even make it uh, better, in a sense. So for example, multiple chats, sending files, sending pictures. In other words, it'll, everything becomes, instead of a certainty, we move it towards probability. And the probability is in your favor. Um, yes, additionally, um, I will be working on, on, on various forms of padding for, for cases like this to basically increase this high the probability that there will be concurrent traffic at the same time um, from multiple Tor clients, uh, which will pr further frustrate the discovery of the social graph based on simple traffic analysis, especially for low traffic cases such as Ricochet. Um, uh, so the, just to wrap up that Tor applications piece, um, in 2016 and beyond, uh, we're going to try and focus heavily on usability and getting more people to be able to use Tor, eliminating the barriers to finding Tor, uh, downloading Tor, um, being able, to, especially for censored use, users, and being able to install Tor. Uh, there's still some snags. We're, allow, we're aware of various difficulties that cause people to stop at various stages of that process, and we want to try and work for to eliminate them. Um, we also, of course, want to increase coordination, share graphics, visual aesthetics, and um, uh, coordinate the ability to share the, the tour process. And we'll also want to create a space for more experimentation, for more things like Ricochet. There's probably a lot more ideas like Ricochet out there that could be uh, leverage of the Tor protocol and especially hidden services in creative ways. So we're looking to create an official sanctioned space as part of Tor uh, to give them a home. And so look for that in the coming months on the, on the Tor blog. All right. Um, I just wanted to put in a picture of a guy wearing a Slayer t-shirt. <laughs> so. Um, there it is, that's Trevor Paglin. Some of you may remember him from such things as helping to film Citizen Four, building satellites that burn up in space or that, uh, that are actually currently on other satellites. Um, and this, uh, on the left is Leif Riggi. He's sort of the person that taught me how to use computers. And uh, he is an incredible free software developer, Trevor Paglin and myself. And this is a cube, the autonomy cube, which we talked about last year, uh, because we think that culture is very important. And uh, we think that it's important to actually get people to understand understand the struggle that exists right now. Um, so this is installed in a museum right now in Germany in the city of Oldenburg at the Edith Rus House. And it actually opened several months ago. Um, it's filled with classified documents. It has really interesting things to go and read. I highly encourage you to go and read. We build a reading room about anonymity papers, uh, about things that are happening, about how corporations track you. And then the entire museum is a, an open Wi-Fi network that routes you transparently through Tor. So in Germany, a free, open Wi-Fi network that isn't run by Freifunk, uh, much respect to them. But we wanted to make it possible for you to just go and have the ability to bootstrap yourself anonymously if you needed to. And also, these four boards are Novena boards. And these Novena boards are free and open hardware devices made by Bunny and Sean in Singapore, where you could, if you wanted to, download the schematics and fab it yourself. And it's running the Debian GNU Linux universal operating system. And it is a, a, it's an actual Tor exit node with absolutely every port allowed. So the museum's infrastructure itself on the city's internet connection, actually, is a Tor exit node for the whole world to be able to use the internet anonymously. The museum's infrastructure. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. 
the museum's infrastructure is not just helping people in Oldenburg, it's helping people all around the world to be able to communicate anonymously. And uh, it's quite amazing, actually, because when cultural institutions stand up for this, we recognize it's not just a problem of over there stand, right? We have mass surveillance and corporate surveillance in the West, and we need to deal with that here by creating spaces like this. But that said, we also need to make sure that we create spaces in people's minds all around the world. And I want to introduce to you someone who's incredibly awesome, the most badass radical librarian around. This is Allison. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. Allison <laughs> is going to talk about uh, a library freedom project. Hi, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. It's my first CCC. And I'm on stage, and it's very exciting. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my organization, Library Freedom Project. I'm the director. And what we do, we have a partnership with Tor Project to do community outreach around Tor and other, other privacy-enhancing technologies, uh, making Tor network more strong, and making tools like Tor Browser more ubiquitous and mainstream all with the help of a coalition of radical militant librarians. Um, so we introduced you to the Library Freedom Project back in February. Uh, we told you a little bit about the kind of work that we do, mostly in US libraries, increasingly internationally, where essentially we teach them about tools like Tor Browser, how to install it on their local computers, how to teach it into um, computer classes that they offer for free in the library, or one-on-one -on -one technology sessions for their community. And we've had a really amazing year since then. Um, in addition to working with the Tor Project, we're really fortunate to work with the American Civil Liberties Union. Um, if you're not familiar with them, they're basically, yeah, they're the badasses who have been suing the US intelligence agencies and police for about 100 years. Um, that is me with, uh, with two people from the ACLU of Massachusetts, Jesse Rossman, who's a surveillance law expert, and Cade Crockford, who is an activist with the ACLU, and they're here. If you see that human, buy them a drink and ask them about the surveillance capabilities of the US police. Um, so <laughs> it's pretty cool. It's a great. It's a great partnership with ACLU because basically they can teach why we need to use tools like Tor Browser. So how to use them is super, super important, but you need to know about the authorizations, the programs, all the bad laws, and the uses of them against ordinary people. So why do we teach this stuff to librarians? It's basically for two big reasons. Um, one of them is that libraries and librarians have an amazing history of activism around privacy, fighting surveillance, and fighting censorship. Um, in the US, where I live, librarians were some of the staunchest opponents of the USA Patriot Act from the beginning when it was codified back in 2002. Um, they made t-shirts that said another hysterical librarian uh, for privacy because of the, what, the attorney general at the time called them hysterical for, their, for the fact that they didn't want this awful authorization to go through. And of course, then after Snowden, we learned many more things about just how bad the Patriot Act was. So librarians were some of the first people to oppose that. They also have fought back against national national security letters, which are the US government information requests that sometimes go to software providers and other internet services um, that have an attached gag order that basically say, you have to give this information about your users, and you can't tell anyone that you got it. Well, libraries got one of these and fought back against it and won. Um, they also, all the way back in the 1950s even, at the height of anti-communist fervor and FUD um, around the time of the House on american Activities Committee, librarians came out with this amazing statement called the Freedom to Read Statement that I think really is the, it's a beautiful text, it's about two pages long, and it is the, their commitment to privacy and democratic ideals um, made manifest. And I have a little excerpt from it here, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you because I understand I'm a little pressed for time, um, but the last line is my favorite, it says, freedom itself is a dangerous way of life, but it is ours. So everybody go get that tattooed, you know, on your forehead or whatever. Um, so <laughs> the history, <laughs> thank you. The history of activism is one of the big things. So the second part is more practical. Libraries have an amazing relationship to their local communities that doesn't really exist anywhere else, especially in this era of privatization and the destruction of public commons. Libraries have uh, already free computer classes in many places, sometimes the only free computer help that you can get anywhere. Um, they offer free computer terminals to many people who don't have any other computer access. They're trusted community spaces. They already teach um, about a 
whole number of things. So we think they're really the ideal location for people to learn about things like Tor Browser. Um, so it's been going really well. Uh, this year, we have visited um, hundreds of, of different locations. We've, we've trained about 2,300 librarians in the US and Canada and a few other countries, Australia, UK, um, and Ireland. Um, we, <laughs> we held an amazing conference. You might recognize this as NoiseBridge. Any NoiseBridge fans here? I hope so. Come on, there's got to be more NoiseBridge fans than that. Chris. Uh, we had an amazing conference in NoiseBridge, and actually, my co-organizer is also here, April Glazer, so you can buy her a drink, she's right over there. Um, there has been a huge response from the library community. They want to learn about Tor Browser. They're so excited that finally there is a practical way for them to help protect their patrons' privacy. They've cared about this stuff from an ideological and ethical standpoint for a really long time, and now they know that there are tools that they can actually use and implement in their libraries and teach their community to help them take back their privacy. Um, we're really lucky that not only do we get to teach librarians, but occasionally we get invited to visit the local communities themselves. So, you know, we teach how to teach privacy classes with Tor as a big focus, um, but sometimes we get to meet the local community members themselves. So I wanted to show you this picture of a recent visit that I made to Yonkers, New York. Um, it was a class just for teens. They're all Holden Tor stickers, if you can see that, and Library Freedom Project stickers. Um, this is a great picture that sort of is emblematic of the kind of community that we get to visit. Uh, Yonkers is one of the poorest cities in the US. These kids are, um, many of them are immigrants, their parents are immigrants, they face surveillance and state violence as a matter of their regular everyday lives. For them, privacy is not just a human right, but it's sometimes a matter of life and death. And these kids are just some of the amazing people that we get to see. Also, just to give you an idea of how the public perception around privacy is shifting, in my anecdotal experience, we had 65 teenagers come to this class. If you have a teenager or if you've been a teenager, you know teenagers don't show up for stuff. They don't do that. 65 kids came to this and they were so excited. This was just the group that was left over at the end that had so many questions and wanted more stickers to bring back to their friends. So it's pretty cool stuff. Recently, we embarked on a new project, bringing Tor relays into libraries. Uh, this is Nima Fatimi with me um, when we set up our pilot at a, law, a library in New Hampshire, um, which is the state just above where I live in the United States. And we, um, we basically decided to do this project because um, we thought it was a really great continuation of the work that we were already doing, teaching and training librarians around using Tor. Um, we wanted to take it a step further and take the information infrastructure that libraries already have. Many of them are moving to really fast internet. Um, they can donate an IP address and some bandwidth. Uh, and they, they, many of them want to do kind of the next thing to help protect privacy, and not just in their local communities as well. They want to help protect internet freedom everywhere. So we thought it was a really great sort of next step to go. So we set up our pilot project in New Hampshire. It went pretty well. We got a lot of great press attention, a lot of really great local and global community support. We also got the attention of the Department of Homeland Security. <laughs> and they basically they contacted the local police in this town in New Hampshire and they, they said, you know, this is stupid and, and bad and criminal and you should shut this down. And uh, the library was understandably shaken by this and temporarily suspended the operation of the relay. So we responded um, by writing a letter uh, an open letter from Library Freedom Project, from Tor Project, from ACLU, and a broad coalition of public interest groups and luminary individuals, including the Electronic Frontier Foundation, uh, the Freedom of the Press Foundation, uh, the Free Software Foundation, and all of our other friends, many of whom are in this audience today. Um, we wrote this letter to the library, basically affirming our commitment to them, how much we are proud of them for participating in this project, and how much we wanted them to continue. We put a lot of nice, you know, ideological, why this is important, warm, fuzzy stuff. We also got EFF to start a petition for us, and over a weekend, we got about 4,500 signatures um, from all over the world. The library was flooded with emails, calls, only one negative one, just one out of hundreds, and that person was a little confused, so I'm, you know, I'm not even counting that necessarily. Um, it was like a conspiracy type thing. So uh, we, 
we got, they got this amazing support, and this was all in anticipation of their board meeting that was going to happen a few days later, where the board was going to decide what to do about the relay. So Nima and I show up to New Hampshire on a Tuesday night. You might imagine what a library board meeting in rural New Hampshire is typically like. Um, it was nothing like that. So we get outside, and there's a protest happening already. Um, many people holding pro-tour signs. Um, this was just a glimpse of it. And it, the look on my face is because someone pointed to a very small child and said, Allison, look at that child over there. And this tiny little girl was holding a sign that said, down with big brother. And I was like, I'm done. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's it. I got to go home. So we went into the board meeting, and we were met with uh, about four dozen people and media and a huge um, amount of support. Many of the community members um, expressed how much they love Tor, that this, um, this whole incident made them download Tor and check it out for themselves. Um, basically, it galvanized this community into a greater level of support than we even had when we initially set it up about a month earlier. Um, people who had no idea that the library was doing this heard about it because it got a huge amount of media attention, um, thanks to a story by Julie Englund um, in ProPublica that broke the news to everybody, and then it just went like wildfire. Um, so as you might imagine, uh, the relay went back online that night. Um, we were super successful. Everybody in the community was incredibly excited about it and supportive. And what has happened now is that this community has sort of, they've, like I said, they've been galvanized to, to support TOR even more. They're, um, the library has now allotted some of their staff time and travel budget to help other libraries in the area set up TOR relays. Um, they're speaking about TOR. <laughs> Thank you. They're speaking about TOR at conferences. Um, and this is, ha has really caught on in the greater library community as well. So I mentioned already the kind of success that we've had at Library Freedom Project in teaching tools like TOR Browser and getting folks to bring us in for trainings. This is even bigger than that. Um, libraries are now organizing their you know, staff training days around, you know, should we participate in the TOR Relay Project? Or how can we do this best? Um, what's the kind of, what's the best angle for us? So we're really excited to do announced that um, we're going to be continuing the Relay project at scale. Um, Nima Fatimi, who is now also in this picture again, I'm really sad that he can't be here. He's wonderful and essential to this project. Um, but he will now be able to um, travel across uh, the US, and we hope to go a little further, um, opening up more Relays in libraries. Um, we're going to continue teaching, of course, about Tor Browser and other privacy-enhancing free software. Um, we're now going to incorporate some other Tor services, so um, we're really excited to bring Let's Encrypt into libraries, and while we're there, why not run a hidden service on the library's web server? Um, among many other things, uh, the other goals for Library Freedom Project are to take this to a much more international level. So if you uh, want to do this in your country, you know your librarian, put them in touch with us. Um, you can follow our progress on libraryfreedomproject.org or at libraryfreedom on Twitter, um, and we're always sort of posting on tour blog about stuff that's going on with us. So thank you so much for letting me tell you about it. It's really a pleasure to be here. Oh, my God. <laughs> you want to advance? You can advance it, yeah. So that's a really tough act to follow. But we, uh, we're very pressed for time now. And we want to make sure that we can tell you two big things. And one of them is that, as you know, we were looking for an executive director because our spirit animal, Roger. <laughs> sli Slide. Right. He, um, he couldn't do it all. And in fact, we needed someone to help us. And we needed someone to help us who has the respect not only of the community here, but the community basically all around the world. And we couldn't think of a better person. In fact, when we came up with a list of people, the person that we ended up with was the dream candidate for a number of the people in the Tor Project and around the world. And so, I, I mean, I have to say that I'm so excited I'm so excited that we have her as our executive director. I used to think that our ship was going to sink, that we would all go to prison, and that may still happen, the second part. But the first part, the first part for sure is not going to happen. We found someone who I believe will keep the Tor project going long after all of us are dead and buried, hopefully not in shallow graves. So this is Shari Steele.
Thanks. Thanks. It's actually so fun to be back in this community again. It, I wasn't gone for very long. I had so much for retirement. It didn't work out for me, but that's okay. I'm really excited. Um, I have had, uh, we're, we're so tight on time. So I want to just tell you there were two big mandates that I was given when I first was hired on. One is help build a great infrastructure so that Tour project is sustainable, working on that. The other thing is money. Um, we need to diversify our funding sources. As everybody knows here, the government funding has been really difficult for us, specifically because it's all restricted. And so it limits the kinds of things we want to do. When you get the, 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 the developers in a room blue skying about the things that they want to do, it's incredible. Really, really brilliant people who want to do great things, but they're really limited when the funding says they have to do particular things. So we happen to be doing our very first ever crowdfunding campaign right now. Um, I want to give a shout out to Katina Bishop, who is here somewhere and who is uh, running the campaign for us and is just doing an amazing job. Um, as of last count, which is a couple of days ago, um, we had over 3,000 individual donors and over $120,000, um, which is incredible for a very first time when we didn't even really have a mechanism in place to be collecting this money even. So it's really great. Um, and I want to also say that um, we have a limited number of these t-shirts that I brought in a suitcase from Seattle. So, um, and they are going to be available. Um, if you come down to the uh, Well Holland booth at the Noisy Square, come talk with us, um, give a donation. We're doing a special, it's normally a $100 donation to get a shirt, but for the conference, we'll do uh, for 60 euro, um, we, you can get a shirt and it would be great. You'd be able to show your support. And you can also donate online if you don't want to do that here. Um, and that's the, that's the URL. Um, and to end, we'd like to have a, a word from Down Under. Good day to you, fellow members of the intergalactic resistance against dystopian bastardry. It is I, George Orwell, with an urgent message for planet Earth as it embarks on a new orbit, transmitting via the juice channeling portal. Our time is short, so let's get straight to the point, shall we? This transmission goes out to all you internet citizens, denizens of the one remaining free frequency, in whose hands rests the fate of humanity. Lord. When I last appeared to you, I warned you, noobs, you must not lose the internet. Now before I proceed, let us clarify one crucial thing. The internet is not virtual reality, it is actual reality. Are you still with me? Good. Now ask yourselves, would you let some fascist dictate with whom you can and cannot communicate? Because that's what happens every time a government blacklists a website domain. Would you let anyone force you to get all your information from cable TV? That's effectively the case if you allow corporations to kill net neutrality. Would you let the Thought Police install telescreens in your house, monitor and record everything you do, every time you move, every word you've read, to peer into the most private nook of all, your head? Because that's what happens when you let your governments monitor the net and enact mandatory data retention laws! <laughs> If you answered no to all those questions, then we can safely deduce that terms like online, IRL, and in cyberspace are newspeak. They confuse the truth. There is no cybersphere, there is only life here. It follows that if you have an oppressive internet, you have an oppressive society too. Remember, online is real life. Your digital rights are no different from everyday human rights. And don't give me that BS that you don't care about privacy because you have nothing to hide. That's pure doublethink. As Comrade Snowden clearly explained, that's like saying you don't care about free speech because you have nothing to say. Stick that up your memory holes and smoke it. No. Pig's ass! The portal is closing! I'm losing you! I'll leave you with a new tool to use. I assume you've all been fitted with one of these spying devices. Well, here's an app you can use in spite of this. It's called Signal, and yes, it's free and simple. Install it and tell all your contacts to mingle. Then all your calls and texts will be encrypted. So even if Big Brother sees them, the won't be able to read them. Ha ha! Now that's a smartphone! 
Our time is up. Until the next transmission, heed the words of George Orwell, or should I say, George Torwell. Just as I went to Spain to fight the dirty fascists, you can come to Onion Land now and fight Big Brother's filthy tactics. If you're a pro, run a node and strengthen the code. Or if you're in the outer party and can afford it, send Tor some of your dough. Special salute to all my comrades at the State of the Onion. Have a hacking! Now go forth and hack <laughs> Big Brother. That mendacious mother fucking sucking you. bastard son of a corporatist bitch. <laughs> So I think that's all the time that we have. Thank you very much for coming, and thank you all for your material support. Unfortunately, we won't have time for a Q&A, but I heard that some of the crew will now go to the Vau Holland booth um, at Moise Square uh, down in the um, foyer and might be ready to answer questions there if you have any. Uh.